You are listening to The Emulsion Podcast, a show that informs and inspires the restaurant industry to work, live, and create better. My name is Justin Kana. I'm a chef and media producer with almost 10 years of experience in award-winning restaurants all over the world. I created this show as a way to give back, to inspire the next generation, and help you progress your career. The Emulsion Podcast is sponsored by you folks, and Patreon is where that happens. If you're here as a return listener and enjoy the episode you just came from and happen to want to support more episodes, visit patreon.com slash Justin Kana. I'd really appreciate it if you can. I totally understand if you can't. Free ways you can support this show include leaving a like or comment on this episode, filling up all five stars on iTunes so more people can find us, or simply sharing an episode with a friend. This is an interview episode. If you missed out on asking your burning question to today's guest, that's probably because you aren't following me on Instagram or Twitter. I use the handy dandy question feature in my Instagram stories, and I also start a thread for each guest on Twitter. So between the two of those, that's the best way to take advantage of the access I hope to bring you with this show and all of the interviews I do. Let's learn a little bit more about today's interviewee, shall we? Either a tool has it or it doesn't. Uh, And if it has it, what I want to do is get to know the maker behind it uh, and and why and how they came up with that design and why they went with those materials and how they got into making chef's knives to begin with. Um, you know, Eating Tools is a, a, a small shop and as the owner, I curate everything that you see there and there has to be some... There has to be some connection between me and the maker. What is up, folks? It's great to see you. Today's guest is Abe Shaw, owner of Eating Tools, a curated collection of unique and extraordinary handmade culinary utensils, many of which can only actually be purchased through Abe and his shop. This episode was super fun. You can expect us to talk through his origin stories growing up in upstate New York and how a fixed blade skinning knife from northern Sweden inspired his trajectory for what Eating Tools is now. Uh, We talk about what he he looks for in a maker to actually bring into the shop those kind of features that he looks for in the, not only the story of the tools but the story of the person behind it the power of curation and being able to be a connector between foodies and these craftsmen as well as the professional chefs that use his gear on the daily creating your own dream job or uh, dream reality whatever you want to call it Noma's Instagram feed we also cover that a little bit and so much more I was honored to have Abe on the show a little personal aside from me when you're a youth YouTuber or a content creator or whatever you would call someone like me, when you're just starting off, brands don't approach you to review their gear. It's you essentially have to do that legwork yourself. And I remember back when I had like 300 subscribers, it was definitely less than 500 subscribers on YouTube. I was reaching out to brands left and right to try to get that process going, to try to just get out there and hustle amongst all the no's that I was getting. Eating tools was like this shining golden yes. And Abe was incredibly entrusting in me as being this super tiny creator to make content for him and highlight his tools, the ones that he was curating. Um, and it's just how that's how the plating with chopsticks video came about. And now it has almost 5,000 views. So if nothing else, this episode is me showing love to Abe and putting him a little bit more on you folks, your folks's radar. If you've got a love for food and dining, but aren't sure if the traditional restaurant is for you, or if you're like me and you're just a straight up gearhead, this episode is definitely going to rock your socks off. Definitely a lot of little nuggets uh, of his story that, uh, that can show you that it is possible to go out there and make your dream reality. So enough intro. This is my conversation conversation with Abe Shaw. Maybe we can just dive right into it. I know I know I asked a little bit about what you're up to, but I'd, I'd love to hear a little bit of your kind of state of the union on chefs and media and dining culture, because being a being a shop owner, you kind of interact with chefs sometimes. Sometimes you interact with, uh, you know, gung ho, entertaining home cooks. And sometimes it's I mean, your Instagram presence is huge as well. So uh, what are your thoughts? What are you excited about? I, uh, you know, I guess the most exciting is is sort of the uh, high level direction that the culinary world in general is taking. One of um, you know uh, creating experiences and and getting into the the nitty gritty of all aspects of of cooking and and the subsequent dining uh you know it's no longer enough to have a a a restaurant with a kitchen and a dining room and a chef you know um restaurateurs are creating you know creating real uh, brands if you will from a, a sort of marketing perspective but you know creating real experiences um and and what 
that does in part is get everyone involved in, you know, that business and that world uh, into sort of a different frame of mind, um, you know, and on the, the tool and uh, gear side of, of the kitchen and even of dining and, and in dining rooms. Um, it means that, you know, these tools that I love uh, and that these makers who I have the pleasure of working with, you know, their wares are becoming an integral part of, of that scene, um, you know, as the media, uh, you know, does what it has been for years now for, for chefs and restaurateurs, uh, you know, putting them under a spotlight in a, in a wonderful way and you know, I was just reveling in what the the media uh, and, and all of these amazing uh, cooking shows and documentaries and podcasts, not unlike your own, mm. uh, have done for the culinary world. Um, you know, shining a spotlight not just on new chefs and, and new restaurants and, you know, new cuisines that diners and enthusiasts may another may not otherwise have been exposed to. Um, but, you know, what that does for the details and the nuances of the profession of the, um, you know, of the hobby, if you will, uh, for the, the home cooks and, and the, you know, foodies, as, as some call themselves. Sure. Uh, it, it's all come together to highlight the subtleties of not just the back of the house and and the the ever evolving techniques and tools and tips and tricks that you know chefs can now share with one another with their diners, uh, but also on the front of the house, whether it be at home or or in a four star dining room, um, you know the the real experience that can be created when there is so much enthusiasm and opportunity for creativity uh you know in the food world in general um as as food and eating and and consuming you know for sustenance has transformed into a, a world of of art all of its own you know that is exactly what i think provides opportunity for for an, an ever expanding array of tools, cuisines, experimentations with food and dining and serving and hosting and entertaining um, so many, so many niches within the greater culinary world are, are sort of being brought together. Right. Uh, it's, it's amazing to see. Um, I, I'm, I'm no extraordinary chef. Uh, I've, I've worked in many restaurants and I've never worked in fine dining. Uh, I can, I can cook, but, uh, you probably don't want me to, uh, you know, all of that said, um, that's, that's part of what's neat about what's going on is it's giving everyone an opportunity to, to be and feel immersed, uh, in this world, regardless of where their, you know, specialties may lie. Right. And I mean, good on you for, for, for realizing that where it's like, I have this insane passion for, for the, the dining experience, but my strengths don't lie in the, in the dining room. My strengths don't lie in the kitchen. So I'm going to be this kind of force of connection between, you know, the diner and the chef and the, the, the front of house. So you, your, your tagline is, is, is don't eat with your hands. So wh wh when did, where did that come from? And, and maybe you can talk a little bit about eating tools as a brand. I uh, would love to. Uh, don't eat with your hands has been a fun one. It's always a tricky one because, of course, I love eating with my hands as much as the uh, next person. Um, but eating tools originally was, uh, you know, I envisioned it as a, an almost eclectic and out of this world collection of, of uh, you know, eating tools that people had never seen before. I, I wanted people who had browsed, you know, the Williams and Sonomas and Sir Tobbs of the world uh, and, and explored every specialty eating tool out there. I, I wanted those people to come to eating tools and have their jaws drop and say, oh my goodness, I, I didn't even know, uh, you know, handcrafted titanium chopsticks existed. Mm -hmm. uh, or a set of, of um, you know, micro... 
uh, olive tongs uh, was even out there. Um, and I, I didn't know where it was going to go. Uh, I wanted it to grow organically. Um, I, I had relationships with absolutely extraordinary artisans and artists, uh, blacksmiths, woodworkers, metal workers from all over the world. Uh, and they were creating culinary tools that um, I, I knew deserved to uh, be exposed to a larger audience. Uh, and Don't Eat With Your Hands was uh, a, a sort of natural progression from the idea of uh, literally eating tools. Uh, mm. you know, I played early on with, the, with simply the, the straightforward name of tools to eat with. Uh, and, and Don't Eat With Your Hands had a certain ring to it. I, I have a fantastic designer and artist uh, friend in Russia who created a beautiful Don't Eat With Your Hands logo for me that now adorns some t-shirts uh, here at my home. And uh, it, uh, it works, it's, it's catchy and, and, it, uh, and it always elicits a, a little controversy. <laughs> right, yeah. My, with my hands too. Uh -huh. Can you set the timeline? When, when was that, when, when eating tools kind of started to take shape for you? It's hard to believe. This was back in uh, 2011, 2012. Got I it. had worked in the knife world for many, many years. And, and that's where I developed relationships with artists. Uh, I was fortunate enough to spend time in, in a number of machine shops. And I, I learned my way around the, the production process. Um, kind of like having me you know, cook for you. You probably don't want me to make you a knife personally. <laughs> uh, but that said, you know, I, I had the chance to really gain an appreciation for the, the people, their processes, the materials, uh, and all of the nuances. Um, and, and moving from non-culinary knives into culinary knives, was a, a really eye-opening experience because here are these incredibly, uh, you know, detailed, beautifully made, handcrafted objects that, while they could live in a glass case on display, uh, unlike so many of the other edged tools out there uh, at this kind of quality level, you know, these are knives made to be used every day in a kitchen. Uh, and not just used every day, but used to, you know, prepare meals with friends, with family, um, you know, and, and there's something really special about that. I mean, food at the end of the day is, you know, it's our lifeblood. It's not just delicious morsels of, of endless variety to enjoy, uh, you know, it's also what keeps us and every other animal on earth going. Right, right. A really neat connection there. Right, and 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 maybe that answers the question I was going to act, actually ask you about that. If there was something specific about dining that attracts you to it, because I, I find that with with a lot of uh, people that I've interviewed, is that there, there, there's just something about food and something about that experience, or. or the very human, because I mean, like, like, realistically, you could have gone deep into, if you were really passionate about makers, you could have gone really deep into um, like barber shops, right? Like you could be carrying really high end shears for barbers or uh, guitar equipment, you know, like what is there something maybe you've answered it already about about dining and food that that steers you in that direction or maybe something from your past? Yeah, yeah. Um... So many things. Um, and I love this question because it gets me thinking about my childhood and, and the variety of, of food and uh, farming and homegrown and home cooked ingredients that were used and, and the, the variety of cuisines from all over the world that I was encouraged to try from young ages. Uh, I've always been one to taste anything I could get my hands on. Uh, and from that perspective, you know, that's, that's the neat thing about food. It's, it's sustenance, uh, it's a necessity. Uh, and at the same time, there's an endless variety of the ways we can consume it. Uh, and when we do consume it, uh, you know, now that modern civilization is at a point where, you know, we don't need to simply uh, hunt to eat and sleep and find shelter, you know, it, we, we now have the time to enjoy the dining experience, um, you know, and hopefully that does include good 
uh, healthy, sustainable, you know, homegrown ingredients whenever possible. Uh, but no matter what you're eating, you know, part of the beauty of eating in, in today's busy world, uh, I've always liked to say, you know, breakfast, lunch, and dinner are like three little vacations every day. Awesome. There, there are opportunities to disconnect from whatever weight might be on your shoulders, you know, sit down and enjoy something delicious or stand up and enjoy something delicious or even eat while you're working if you have to. But when you put that food in your mouth, there's an instant, uh, you know, there's an instant connection to a greater world, to the, the, the ingredients, the people that prepared it. Um, you know, maybe that was you, maybe, maybe taking that first bite just, uh, you know, takes things down a notch and reminds you of the chopping you did that morning to prepare your lunch for, you know, the, the busy day at the office. Sure. Do you, do you have any thought or maybe we can expand on that a little bit because I would, I, I was actually talking about this the other day with a friend, how the culture for, for eating has been kind of, cause I was, I was in Europe in January and I had the pleasure of, you know, having that lunch in Paris where, you know, th- three quarters of the tables are having a glass of wine with their meal. And that doesn't exist here, here, at least in Seattle. I mean, maybe in New York, New York a little bit more, but the, 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 like you said, lunch happens at your desk and it's, it's at work and you don't take that, that two hour lunch or that, that 90 minute lunch with, with a friend and just sit and talk and have a coffee and, and when, and whatever, it's kind of this rushed process. Do you, do you have any thoughts on that? You, like, I mean, it has to happen at a certain point because there's, there's 24 hours in a day, but do you feel like we should be spending a little bit more time focusing on, on, on the meal, the, the ritual? Hey, I am all for a siesta. Mm. Um, yeah, you know, it's a tough one. I, I mean, I am born and raised here in the States. Uh, like you, I was in Europe a couple of months ago uh, in Spain, France, Germany. And it's true, you know, the approach to food and meals goes hand in hand with, um, you know, a, a very different culture on a lot of levels. And I, I am envious uh, on one hand of the ability to, to sit down and, and really enjoy, whether it be a, a fast meal or a, a you know, a, a four course meal with a full bottle of wine. Um, I'm envious of it. On the other hand, we have to work with what we have, you know, and I'm, I'm used to this, uh, busy go, 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 you know, as some would say, uh, uh, live to work culture that we have here in the States. And I think there are great ways to sort of make the best of that. I mean, there, you know, I live here in New York city where things move just as fast as they possibly could. Uh, and the city is adapted. There are unbelievable food trucks and, and mom and pop shops, on every corner, everywhere. Uh, and so they cater to people who need to eat under those circumstances. And just like you can sit back and relax at a cafe in Paris, um, and, and that's really hard to beat anywhere in the world, uh, you know, you can, uh, I can get a real thrill from like running down the street to my favorite food truck and grabbing a couple of tacos uh and and just almost being in awe of the ability of the people in that truck you know who are maybe in this tiny little cramped hot space on a summer day for eight straight hours making other people food but they're they're doing it with the same passion with the same you know uh adherence to their you know their culture's ideals when it comes to to whatever it is that they're making um i think there's always a way to have that same appreciation for the food regardless of how quickly or slowly you've got to throw it back right right taking it taking it a step where did you grow up abe uh, I spent most of my childhood upstate in Ithaca, New York, a, a beautiful little isolated upstate college town with a massive farmer's market and, and homegrown goods culture. And uh, because it being a college town, influences from all over the world. Anyway, I could go on and on about Ithaca. Right, right. I mean, I, I was in 
Poughkeepsie for college. So upstate New York is no, no, no stranger. It's, it's beautiful. I, I remember when um, I went to go visit a, a friend in, in Paris who was working at per se, he was talking about his dream was to move to upstate New York and open a restaurant because it was, it's, it's such a paradise. It was, he was, he was talking about it being the next uh, Napa in a sense. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I mean, one of the beautiful parts of being here in New York City is we get farmers markets um, unlike any I've seen. Now, that said, I was in Southern California recently and there are usually some avocados and fresh fruit in my bag. For, 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 right. Um, but, the, you know, the number of farms from whether it be upstate New York or, you know, the countryside of New Jersey and Pennsylvania here in the tri-state area um, to have such access to what is being grown, you know, even two, 300 miles away is unbelievable. And, and so there's, there can be that neat connection between, you know, the big urban now and, and Ithaca that I, you know, still dream about. When, when, when you were growing up, and, and I know I posed the question to you earlier when, when the, I made the age 13, but it can be any age when, you, you know, I, I would like to say probably before when you were 15. Was there anything that you were into that you see has lent itself to the life that you have now with eating tools, whether you were into, you know, weird, making weird oh, yeah. stuff or, hey, yeah. Nice the tools and the craft behind beautifully made wares slowly evolved to, you know, the, the collection and love that I have for them now and the times that I've spent at night shows around the world. The first time I ever visited Paris, speaking of Paris, was uh, for a night show. Um, I worked in restaurants when I was younger. Uh, and more recently, I've done a lot of web work. And so eating tools was a natural progression from all of that. Right. Uh, young, uh, I will readily admit, it was nice on my brain as a, as a little boy. They blew my mind. <laughs> So what what was it? Was it like hunt? Because I know like my little brother is fifteen and he's super into um, like the the throwing stars and the hunting knives. Was it those kind of knives? Just to kind of get specific, or was it kitchen knives? Uh, it was a variety. No, it wasn't kitchen knives. Uh, it, it was folding knives. It was fixed blade knives. It was uh, bayonets and the history behind, you know, these different designs and the different kinds of knives that are designed for different uses all over the world. I traveled Europe with my father when I was young and brought home a, you know, a beautiful handmade uh, fixed blade skinning knife from Northern Sweden. Uh, I experienced my first uh, switchblade in in Berlin in the you know early nineties. Uh, from there, I got uh, very much into bally song or uh, butterfly knives. Um, and there's an entire uh, sort of world and and sport involved in the manipulation of uh, butterfly knives. Um, and so you know across all of these different styles. Uh, and the different people all over the world making the different styles and therefore infusing their own, you know, culture into into each one. Uh, uh, there was just never any shortage right. of, of inspiration. Uh, so you it, know, it's art. It's truly art. Right. So it was it was the story that of, of each one that kind of drew you in. It wasn't um, like I know a lot of I was certainly the kid who would like draw certain things did you ever did you ever do that like draw draw knives or or was it kind of hearing about you know this was a knife from sweden and and the story behind it that attracted you yeah i'd say it was mostly the story mm -hmm. um and growing up in upstate new york you know i i had friends that hunted and that made their own uh, knives for out in the field. I, I had a very good friend whose father gifted me a knife shortly before I left Ithaca. Um, you know, and that was, I guess, my first exposure to a more or less handmade knife, you know, and the thought that somebody had formed this piece, you know, to a young kid whose, whose parents or grandparents didn't actively um, make things, uh, you know, like that, um, to all of a sudden realize that 
you know, you could take a piece of steel and wood and leather and, you know, raw materials and form them into uh, a, a tool that was meant to be used. It, it was, it was mind boggling to me. And I've always been fascinated by how things work in general, taking sure. apart the family's VCR back in the day. And, um, so to, to just wonder with wide eyes uh, at, at, you know, how things are created, why they are created, you know, how the people that created them decided to create them the way they did. Um, I'm in awe of people that create things that they love. I, I think that's a lot of it. I've always been inspired by people as much mm. as anything. Um, and so, yeah, it really is the people behind the objects. Sure. What What do you look for when when you're wanting to bring in a new maker or a new artist uh, into your kind of portfolio of, of eating tools is, are there any specific uh, points that you look for or, or things that you like to stay away from maybe when you're looking on bringing in someone's products? Um, good question. What do I stay away from? Um, I guess nothing in particular, but because eating tools has such a um, kind of tightly curated and high-end collection of culinary knives. Uh, I try to put together a variety and not step on the toes of artists I'm already working with. Um, I, I mean, the first answer that comes to mind to, to your broader question there is, you know, there's a, a certain... Je ne sais pas, as the French would say, you know, th there's a certain quality to any beautifully designed functional object that is really impossible to put your finger on. And either, either a tool has it or it doesn't. Uh, and if it has it, what I want to do is get to know the maker behind it uh, and, and why and how they came up with that design and why they went with those materials and how they got into making chef's knives to begin with. Um, you know, Eating Tools is a, a, a small shop. And as the owner, I curate everything that you see there. And there has to be some, there has to be some connection between me and the maker. Uh, there has to be something that even I can't quite explain, even in my own words. Uh, but either it's there or it isn't. And and, and are you that. are you usually the one that's seeking these people out, or or now that you've kind of established yourself, are people uh, sending you emails or reaching out, uh, like sending you samples and being like, what what is that process like now? It's a little bit of both. Um, early on, of course, I was I was. Um, scrounging the internet uh, and all of my contacts to find anything that I thought would be a good fit. And I knew that I was going to have to test the waters and some items would, would be wildly popular and some wouldn't. And as eating tools has grown, um, you know, very organically uh, for the last year and a half, two years, it's mostly artists coming to me. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it's really hard, you know, to choose sometimes. Sometimes there's a, and it might just not be uh, the right time. I might already have a product on the site that's similar. Um, you know, but being able to speak with and get to know new artists, whether or not I'm going to be able to work with them immediately, is a real pleasure. I mean, that's you know, that's the best part of eating tools is getting to work with incredibly talented craftspeople who who have a passion unlike just about anybody I've met in the world for, for what they do um, that gets me going. Totally. So sometimes I might not think that I'm going to bring a product on and a maker and I go back and forth uh, via email and we, we send a couple DMS and I get some pictures and we chat on the phone and I decide, you know what, this is, this is, you know, too, too great. I want to tell your story. Um, let's do this. Right. And I think that's fascinating that it's, it's developed into the, the, I mean, it, it, it might, it, I, I would hope it, it is your, your dream job, but it's kind of the, you probably started off being so focused on making sure that your, um, your customers had these amazing tools that they could browse, but what is essentially turned into 
and you can correct me if I'm wrong, is that you, you are providing these amazing tools to your customers, but you're also providing, I mean, eating tools is a platform for these makers to showcase their stuff. So you essentially have two products and two kind of where it's, you know, one, one product is serving the, the makers and one product is serving the customers. You are absolutely right. You hit the nail on the head. Um, uh, that's exactly how I like to think of the the brand that is eating tools. Um, it's not just about, you know, me and, you know, the collection that I've curated or the products themselves, but it really is about uh, the artists and, and telling their story uh, and showcasing not just what they've made, but who they are. Uh, and I, I, you know, tell every maker I work with, I, you know, I like to think that um, they get much more out of our partnership uh, and, you know, being part of the eating tools family, so to speak, than just, you know, the, the money they get from, you know, a given sale. Right. Did, has, did you kind of, you, you knew that that was going to happen or, or did you kind of envision eating tools to, to change in a different way? Did it organically take shape or was this kind of like, you're the puppet master, you knew this was going to happen the whole time? I, uh, without, uh, without being so humble as to call myself the puppet master, <laughs> I would say that, um, that was the idea from, from the beginning. And it's actually evolved um, from that to also include products that I produce and products that I have more of a hand in, um, you know, a collaborative design process for. Uh, so at first it really was about the items and the artists behind them. Um, mm. You know, collection, I, I, I've, I, again, you know, not to be too humble, but I've, I've liked to think of myself as a bit of a, you know, a, a, a gallery curator. If sure. you will. Absolutely. Oh, you know, putting together a, a cohesive collection uh, of the best of the best. And, and, you know, you're not just selling a, a piece of art, but you're selling the story behind it. Uh, so that really was the plan from the beginning. Um, I've been really happy with how it's been received. I feel really, really lucky to, you know, have customers with the same passion for the tools that I do. I, I have developed really wonderful and deep friendships with many of my customers. I've developed really wonderful and deep friendships with many of my makers and artists. Uh, and, uh, and that's given me the opportunity to also, um, you know, produce some tools like our tie sticks, for example. Um, you know, I, I own and manage the tie sticks brand, but for example, Alan Fultz, the original designer and, and, maker in the early days of those titanium chopsticks uh, will always, you know, have a, a part in that story uh, and will always be talked about on eatingtools.com uh, no matter how, how much I might, you know, sort of own that, that brand now. Sure. What, if, if any has changed from the beginning, because I know you said that your your main thing was to source these amazing tools from the start, but did you have you found any sort of change between your customers, whether it's been a change from you know enthusiastic home entertainers to chefs? And would you like to maybe you can talk a little bit about where it's at now, maybe that ratio between home cooks and professional chefs or prof professional restaurant professionals, I guess. Um, and, and if you'd like to see more of, of one or the other. Yeah, you know, the honest answer is that it hasn't changed drastically um, as the chef knife category has grown. And, and actually, a funny thing is that when Eating Tools first launched, I did not anticipate knives to be a big part of it. Um, you know, the chef knife market is a very separate one from almost all of the other tools that I sell. Uh, and I didn't anticipate it becoming as large as it has. Um, I, I thought there were a lot of really talented big players out there already. Uh, and, and I wasn't going to actively try to compete in that. Uh, but again, you know, I, 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 I have the honor of, of being close with so many of the world's best that 
it's gone that direction. And so that market segment growing has led to more sales to more professional chefs, mm. uh, more inquiries from restaurants. Uh, and I would love to see more of that. You know, there's nothing nicer than knowing tools of this quality level are being used every day. Um, and I say that in part because like any tool of this quality and, and this kind of price range, um, you know, they're not necessarily going to be used every day in a kitchen. Uh, mm. I at least put into a rotation, uh, you know, and taken good care of. But to know that they're going to professional chefs is exciting because it means I know they're getting used in, in you know, really practical and necessary ways and by people who are as dedicated to their craft as any. And, and that, of course, is not to say anything about um, uh, home cooks. And, and part of the fun of, of selling to home cooks, and, and, you know, this is connected to the direction that the culinary world has gone in general, um, one of access to more information and more inspiration for everyone out there, uh, is that the tools become a big part of the home kitchen um, and can actually be an inspiration to, you know, uh, to, to cook outside of your comfort zone and to try new things and, and to entertain at home and to cook with friends and family, you know, when you might have otherwise ordered in or gone out to eat. Um, so there is, you know, just like there are, are exciting parts of selling to professional chefs, there are really, uh, really rewarding aspects of selling to home cooks who, uh, you know, who, who use these tools as, as inspiration to, to do new things and to think differently about food. Right. And I, I think that's funny that you mentioned that because like with the home cook, sometimes, I mean, if they were to buy a tool from you, it would definitely be, you know, a, a quote unquote upgrade, but, um, Maybe maybe it's something like you said that they would never have even thought of of purchasing. Whereas for for us chefs, you know, we, we you know, it's it outside of a, a certain increase in performance. A lot of it is is that aesthetic, and I think that's something that it definitely attracted me and the and the beginning stages to your your curated selection is because your stuff looks so good. Like your your eye for stuff is just super super good. I. I would be curious to to hear a little getting into more of like the nitty gritty of, of, of you and, and Abe, you're, you're a shop owner. You, you have all this social media presence and, and, and your dad and, and what is an ideal day in the life for you these days? Uh, great question. I have, uh, I have a two and a half year old son. And so, uh, He's he sort of has to be the the first part of the answer to that question. An ideal day is, um, frankly, one much like today. Uh, I was up with my son very early before school. Uh, I got to get him a, a snack and pick up the subsequent banana peels from the living room floor. <laughs> uh, I cooked him eggs and made him a quick PB and J for his lunchbox. You know, so it started with, um, you know, making food for my boy. Uh, it's a beautiful day here in New York, and I came back from dropping him off, and I get to uh, Instagram a photo of a knife to, you know, 22-plus thousand enthusiastic followers who, who I hope, you know, appreciates my, my eye uh, as much as you do. And, and thank you, by the way, for, for the the compliment and and uh trust in in my sense of course uh and and now here i am you know talking talking to a talented chef and and as enthusiastic a, a foodie and and food mind as i know justin you know here i'm talking about what i get to do every day uh, and, and talking about the the greater food world and at some point i'll probably take a, a photo of a, a new Nick Anger chef knife or Don Carlos Andrade knife that I've recently gotten in. Um, when I, I need a little break from, you know, some of the more monotonous stuff I do at the computer during the day, I'll, 
I'll do some retouching and I'll oil some blades. Uh, I, I write handwritten notes on, on every single, um, you know, order that goes out. I truly love getting to run eating tools. Uh, it, it's a real pleasure. And I mean, I, I, I couldn't even begin. And I try to do this on eating tools, on Instagram, but not as much as I should. Um, you know, can't tell you how thankful I am to, to my makers for entrusting me with their wares and their livelihoods uh, and, and to my customers for, you know, for supporting me and sure. giving me this opportunity. Right. And I, I, I want to acknowledge that for a second because I, I think it's so underrated and I, I am – a lot of people are – don't get to do what they love every day. And I, I, I don't want it to seem like um, – I mean, you're, you're one of the most humble people I've ever spoken with, but it's, it's, it's not bragging, but it's something that you built for yourself. And I want to acknowledge and, and applaud you for that because I mean, you created your dream life and that's, you know, something that I'm working towards as well. I love media just as much as anybody else does. And I, I, I love food and I love gear. And it's something that I'm actively pursuing myself is to, to create that, that dream life. So I, I applaud you for doing that for yourself. Cause it's, it's gotta be a great feeling. Well, thank you very much. Um, and, and same to you, it, it's been a lot of fun. I mean, I've, I've known you for a year plus now, Justin, mm-hmm. and it's been a lot of fun um, watching your content, your, uh, you know, passion for this continue to evolve. Uh, I, I mean, I've always loved what you've done. Uh, I didn't hesitate that first time you reached out to me uh, to work together, and and it's a real pleasure to to be on with you here today. Absolutely. I'm 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 gonna hit you with a couple of uh, rapid fire questions to kind of uh, close it close it out here. Is 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 there a technique that you're still intimidated by in the kitchen? I know you said you don't cook a ton, but is there something that you're like you won't touch or you wish you could master or you still actively practice oh that's a long list <laughs> that's a long list uh, <laughs> uh it's a I'm, I'm setting the stage here it's a it's a saturday morning it's it's the first day off after a work week you're kind of standing in front of the kitchen how do you make your eggs for yourself uh three parts butter one part egg <laughs> whoa Okay, that might be. Uh, it, it's going to start with a lot of butter in the pan. Um, I'm going to go very simple uh, with some very soft scrambled eggs, uh, and they are probably going to get served next to some very fresh avocado. Uh, with a little luck, there's some good fresh smoked uh, salmon or trout in the house. Uh, and it's going to be a simple multi-part meal that gets served, uh, you know, as things come off of the pan or out of the oven. Right. Right. Is, it, d- would that change if you were making eggs for your son? Does he like his eggs a certain way? Sam eats scrambled eggs virtually every morning. And I think it was just a few hours ago that he, it, my heart melted when he said something along the lines of, Dad, you make the best eggs. Oh, killing it. And all I said was, don't tell mom. <laughs> That's amazing. That's amazing. Uh, you somehow get a call right after this interview that you've just won a all expenses paid trip to eat at your dream restaurant. And when you get there, there's someone that you've always wanted to talk to waiting to have dinner with you. Where is that restaurant and who is that person? Um, I'm going to have to say, Renee, in uh, in. Denmark at Noma. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, there there should be no surprises as to why that would be at the top of my list. Um, but I will tell you why he's the one on my mind. And that is their Instagram feed. Um, I, I don't have as much time as I'd like to, to read and to really follow the culinary world like a lot of, you know, chefs and, and other enthusiasts I know do. Uh, but the humbleness of that operation, the creativity combined with simplicity. Um, and, and there's really something for me to be said uh, for simplicity. Um, you know, seeing images and videos of 
raw materials, uh, you know, raw ingredients that I never even knew existed, um, whether it be their their pop up in, in Mexico last year or now that they're back in, in Denmark, uh, it, it's awe inspiring to me. Um, they have also some of the best serviceware that I've uh, had the pleasure of eating with um but whether it's like wooden spoons or like the the mother of pearl spoons or um like the just the way that they present some of the stuff have you have you seen the one from their current menu they're serving like a it's like a, a wax bowl with like a beeswax lid on it it's just insane like some of the serviceware that they're using I'm going to have to go find a photo of that. I yeah, haven't. You, um, yeah, you should. You know, the first thing that came to mind when you started to say that is uh, after their recent move, they auctioned off almost everything from their previous <laughs> restaurant. And I got to say, uh, it was really hard not to hit the buy button. Totally. I mean, mm-hmm. it's, it's, yeah, I, that I, I, and I, I'm going to talk, I have a video that I'm publishing on Thursday that talks about this. Um, all of those little um, add-ons, you know, like, do you serve it with, you know, your standard stainless steel spoon, or do you find an amazing artist to make this wooden spoon for you that has a story because it's f- made out of the wood from a boat that's just outside the restaurant, you know, like, that's what truly elevates the restaurant to an experience, and I think Noma has done that in in, in the best way, you know, very intentional with their, with their serviceware. Could not agree more, and and that's that's the place that experiential dining has has gotten to. Uh, it's mm-hmm. so much more than just the location of the restaurant and the you know the color of the apron on the server and, and uh, you know the dish. Uh, it, it's all of those nuances, the story behind the tools that you're eating it with that that bowl that you were just describing. I mean, it, it all combines to create you know, the meal. Right. Is, uh, one more quick question. Is there an ingredient that you're obsessed with right now? Good question. Um, you know, the word butter is always uh, towards the top of my mind. Uh, you know, a combination of, of butter and garlic. Uh Uh-huh. A lot of amazing things. Right. Um, I grew up with a, a, a beautiful hand-drawn garlic festival poster uh, from a Bay Area festival that my my dad had, you know, my dad had had this poster for years. I was actually visiting him just this weekend and, and was reminded of this poster. Um, garlic is a special thing. Totally, 100%. And, I mean, you're probably getting amazing ramps right now in New York, too, just like that other gar- garlic's super attractive cousin that's only in town for a couple of days. <laughs> yep, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean whether it be ramps or or just a good bitter sweet red onion uh, or garlic, you know, these these categories of of ingredients get me going. Absolutely. Um if 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 you had to have anybody who's listening to to get in touch with you online or or, or find your stuff, where, where do you want them to, to go? Uh, eatingtools.com. You can always email me or contact me there. You'll find our uh, phone numbers. Um, we have an 800 number, 800-742-9948. Uh, I'm Abe, and you are always welcome to email me at abe at eatingtools.com. And then, of course, uh, our Instagram uh, as um, I appreciate you having mentioned Justin is is certainly our most active uh, channel online. It's the best place to you know see the latest and greatest. And uh, I'm a little slower getting back to Instagram DMs than other forms of communication, but you're always welcome to get me there. Totally. And b- before I before I let you go, is is there any tease you can give us with the next uh, with the next chapter of Eating Tools or this next shop, or we just have to kind of eagerly wait? Keep your eyes peeled for some new chef knives uh, that I'm really proud of. Um, collaborative processes between me uh, and and some of the artists that I admire most.
Let's get right into the takeaways from this episode. I always ask that question, what you were into as a kid, because it's so telling of what you're naturally drawn to and what my guests are naturally drawn to. And a lot of that trajectory of where things started can be traced back to those ages for, you know, 11, 12, 13 years old. So if you noticed for Abe, it wasn't the steel alloy makeup or the flair of a unique design or like any artistic details. It was the story behind the knives in his early years that really fascinated him and now you can see that in all of the tools that he curates so if you're at a point where you're struggling to figure out what the next move is or what the right path is if you haven't even started yet spend some time going back to what you were into when you were like an early teenager and then go one level deeper than that it can't just be oh I was really into knives I should be a knife maker figure out what that thing is and then go one level deeper and ask why I really think there's some something there for so many people He also emphasized the element of curation. He is very, very forward in saying that, you know what, I'm not a chef. I don't want to be a front of house captain in a fine dining restaurant and do table side service to guests every single night. And I also don't want to work with my hands as a maker per se. But you know what I am good at? I'm good at having an eye for dope gear and knowing that not only is this an amazing knife, but this knife has the potential to sell to the tribe of people that I've curated online. And that kind of cocktail for him is not only it's it's the gallery curator mindset but it's also having the business savvy to say yes this is beautiful and functional and I can sell this do you see what I mean that's where where I really give Abe credit uh, and I give credit to the success that he's achieved is that kind of perfect mix of all of those things so if you have that problem of being really good at a myriad of different things Take a step back and see where those dots can connect and also intersect with places where those skills provide value to a tribe of people because that's good. it's one thing to have a skill, but it's a profitable thing to have your skills be desired to a set of people. And lastly, I wanted to touch on the fact that as humble as Abe is, keeping that end game in mind, I feel was, and I can see it, was crucial for, for his success. He wasn't looking to be a offshoot of Sir Latab. He wasn't looking to do drop shipping on Amazon and sell cheap gear from China through Instagram. Do you know what I mean? He wanted to be Abe's ideal place to go and get gear with intention. And by not succumbing to those short-term shortcuts along the way and saying, you know what, these early days are going to be rough. I see the vision for this. I know why. I know the, I have the why behind what I'm doing. And that's what ultimately led him to the place where he is now. And he has 100% control. He has brands, makers, and other people approaching him all the time. And it's really, really quite inspiring to see. And much like I do with so many guests on this show, I want to show you that there's really more than one way to win in this life. So hopefully that's a valuable takeaway for you as well. If you want to listen to the full podcast episode, I would love for you to check it out wherever you listen to podcasts. I don't have it on Spotify yet, but uh, Apple Podcasts, Google Play, it's also on YouTube, of course. For links to Abe or eating tools, that's all definitely linked up in the show notes on justinconnacom slash podcast. But that's it for these takeaways. Roll the outro. Thanks for listening to the Emulsion Podcast. I appreciate your ears more than you know. If you enjoyed this episode and you'd like to help sponsor the show, head on over to patreon.com slash justincana. Other ways you can help out right now include giving this show a review on iTunes so more people can find it. I also love seeing you folks liking and commenting on the video if you listen that way, or even just share this episode with a friend. Now is normally why I would tell you that my name is Justin Kana, and I hope you have a good one, but you've probably got another podcast episode to listen to, so I'm just going to get out of the out of the way here excuse excuse me <laughs>